Embrace your hunger, your lust, your desire. The universe is ours for the taking. From Sanctifa Levey of the Cult of the Sacred Union. Slanesh, also known as the Dark Prince, the Prince of Pleasure, the Lord of Excess, the Perfect Prince, and the Prince of Chaos in the Imperium of Man, and she who thirsts among the Eldari is the Chaos God of Pleasure, Pain, Hedonism, Excess, Perfection, and Decadence. Lust, Pride, and Self-Indulgence are the hallmarks of all who follow it. He is, or she, is the youngest of the four major Chaos Gods, having come to full self-awareness within the Materium only during the 30th millennium. The name Slanesh is a corruption of the Eldari term Slaneth, Sla meaning ecstasy or pleasure, Neth meaning lord or prince in the Eldari lexicon, hence the prince of pleasure. Though ironically, the Eldari refer to this foul entity only as Silanthresh, she who thirsts. Slanesh is the prince of pleasure, the dark god, dedicated to pursuit of earthly gratification and the overthrow of all decent behavior, as well as hedonism and pleasure for its own sake. It is the god of obsession, the master of excess in all things, from gluttony to lust to megalomania. Its sacred number is six, and the colors associated with it are riotous purples, pinks, and black. The demonic armies of Slanesh are known as the Legions of Excess. Wherever mortals are ruled by their own unquenchable desires, the Dark Prince of Chaos is there in the shadows, whispering, tempting, and feasting on the banquet of souls. But this is true in all things, not just carnal pleasures. Those who desire to indulge in the finest culinary delights, the most beautiful artworks, even the most sensual clothing, could all be among Slanesh's disciples. Just as importantly, it is also the god of perfection, the singer striving for the most beautiful song, or the warrior who seeks the perfect fighting techniques, both could be devotees of Slanesh. Slanesh was given life by the immorality and hubris of the ancient Eldari Empire. As their empire reached its zenith, the Eldari became lost in their own decadence, for they experienced sensation and emotion to a far greater degree than any other intelligent species of the galaxy. The capabilities of their highly advanced technology meant that they did not need to labor or wage war. Instead, they were able to dedicate their lives to whatever idle pursuits took their fancy. Over several generations, this indolence and hedonism came to rule and pervert their souls. In the Immaterium, the collective psychic reflections of their indolence and amoral hedonism caused a new major chaos power to stir, beginning in the 25th millennium of the Turan calendar. Created by one species' pure dedication to indulgence and excess, the first psychic motes of what would become Slanesh began to coalesce. 
The dormant entity fed upon the unchecked collective psyche of the Eldari, drawing on their lusts and ambitions, their artistry and pursuit of excellence in all things. In turn, as Slanesh grew, its nascent dreams trickled into the minds of the Eldari and fueled their desires, pushing them ever onwards towards their eventual doom. Eventually, their civilization devolved into little more than pleasure cults dedicated to every act of physical, mental, and spiritual fulfillment. Blood stained the statuary of their plazas as crowds of drug-addled maniacs sated their violent desires in the streets of the Eldari homeworlds. On one particularly depraved night, the debauchery reached a terrible crescendo that tore out the heart of their empire and left it ravaged beyond recovery. The fall of the Eldari in the early 30th millennium was signaled by the birth scream of Slanesh, a tsunami of emotion and psychic power that heralded the Prince of Pleasure's arrival in the realm of chaos even as it shaped a new dominion within that dimension to serve as its home, the Dark Prince's realm. The psychic implosion caused by its birth swallowed hundreds of worlds at the heart of the Eldari Empire in what is now the Imperium of Man's Segmentum Obscurus. The blast killed billions of Eldari in a single instant and devoured a great section of the galaxy in the process. Such was its ferocity that it overwhelmed the barrier between the material and the immaterial, forming the massive, permanent warp rift later named by humanity as the Eye of Terror. Rampant and hungry, Slanesh devoured the minds and souls of the Eldari, absorbing them into its essence. Across the galaxy, that ancient species was almost wiped out. After its birth, Slanesh slew most of the Eldari and their gods in the Materium, except for the Eldari god of war, Kaela Mensha Kain. Kain's psychic energy was instead dispersed into many separate pieces scattered across the various infinity circuits of the Eldari craft world. The laughing god, Segorah, also survived his birth by fleeing into the labyrinth dimension of the webway, while Isha, the goddess of fertility and the harvest, was defeated alongside her divine brethren. She was not destroyed outright and absorbed by Slanesh like the rest of the Eldari pantheon. It vanquished her as it had all of the other Eldari gods within the warp, but only took her prisoner rather than absorbing her energies outright. What fell purpose Slanesh had in keeping her alive, none amongst the Eldari now know, but the Prince of Pleasure was ultimately denied its spoils. For some reason, Nurgle the Plague Lord waged war against it to rescue the Eldari Goddess. Why Grandfather Nurgle intervened is unclear, although some Eldari savants believe that one of the older major chaos gods wanted to give the youngest among them a good lesson about its proper place in the order of things. What is known is that Nurgle's demonic legions proved victorious, and the plague god took the Eldari goddess back to its domain in the realm of chaos. Only a relative few Eldari survived his birth feast. Other Eldari survivors included the Harlequin and those craft world Eldari or 
Assyriani who were very far away from their homeworlds when the warp rift formed. Most of the survivors that remain have become sworn enemies of the Dark Prince, and yet a few of them, the Drukari, have formed isolated cabals that still behave as their ancestors did, perversely following the downward spiral of excess and hedonism. That is how events are viewed from the chronology of the material universe. In the warp, however, things are different, for the Immaterium is not bound by linear, four-dimensional time, and events do not occur in a strict sequence of cause and effect. As its rival gods reckon it, Slanesh has always existed in the warp, and yet has never existed at all. Some say, that it is impossible for mortals to look upon the divine face of Sanesh without losing their soul to it, for all who see its face become willing slaves to the whims of a dark prince, embracing its ways with wild abandon. The mere knowledge of Slanesh's existence can cause a world to topple into corruption and hidden depravity. Not even the agents of the Inquisition know for sure how far Slanesh's influence spreads, for wherever the lust for the pleasures of power and temporal gain exists, the talons of Slanesh dig deep. Despite their best efforts, it is almost certain that the Imperium is rotten to the core, just as the Eldari Empire was before it. How long before it succumbs to a similar fate? Find pleasure in every moment, indulge in every whim, let lesser races feel the burden of their crude lives. We are beyond such concerns or worries. Every power is ours to use, every sensation ours to experience. We are truly masters of the galaxy, and all others exist only to satisfy our curiosities. We have earned our position of power, let us forever taste the fruits of such achievement. Time itself is ours to command, we are eternal. Translated Eldari glyphs found amidst the ruins of the Shrine of Celestial Grandeur. If the legends are to be believed, there was one being born into the warp from the depravity and corruption of an entire species. Over thousands and thousands of Tehran years, the ancient Eldari, a race with souls of limitless passion and nearly limitless psychic capabilities allow themselves to be consumed with decadence. Because of their powers, passions, and unique connections to the Immaterium, the disturbances their depravity touched off were singularly dangerous. Even just this vague bit of knowledge is little more than rumor to most inhabitants of the galaxy. Still fewer are privy to the secrets that lie within the shrouded and nearly inaccessible vaults of the Black Library, the hidden craft world that is the ancient repository of Eldari knowledge located deep within the webway. Within these somber chambers, ancient manuscripts point to an unspeakable event that changed the galaxy forever. 
From the perverse thoughts, actions, and deeds of the Eldari, a new god was born. A very real god that was, indeed, a reflection of the species that unwittingly gave it life. Its violent birth signaled the eventual death of the species that gestated it. The tomes of the Black Library say that Slanesh was born from the uncontrolled and excessive need for sensation that had come to preoccupy every moment of every day for nearly every Eldari. Through the incredibly advanced technology and psychic mastery that the species had developed over the Tehran millennia, they passed the days living in unimaginable luxury. They had no need to concern themselves with matters such as daily survival, manual labor, or warding off external threats, nor did they feel bound by social constraints. They had no need to think of how their actions would affect others, not even within their own families, since there would never be a time when they needed anything from them. Everything was at all times theirs. Even death had no real meaning, for in that long ago time before Sarnesh's birth, the souls of the Eldari possessed the ability to reincarnate from the Materium into newborn members of their species soon after death. There was yet nothing within the Empyrean to hunger after those souls. The passions that burn deeply within their souls were unbound and freely explored to depths that other intelligent species could not fathom. A mind freed from all concerns of reciprocation, fear of reprisal, or death is able to turn fully inward and wander into unknown places, seeking previously unconsidered diversions and sensations. When an entire race unshackled its mind in this way, unusually powerful psychic energy was cast into the warp, and the unnatural essence that resides in it responded. The darkest moment of Eldari history, the Fall, is chronicled as a cautionary tale, one that the keepers of the Black Library, known as the Black Council, study continually. Their hope is that some path toward the return to Ascendance, or at least a way to avoid their species' ever-looming doom, can be found. The tale says that the vast majority of the members of the ancient Eldari species, unprepared as they were for the god their unbridled passion and perversion had birthed, were consumed in an instant. Their minds, and worse, their souls, were connected to chaos in a way they could not have foreseen. They had become slaves to darkness, and when their newborn master hungered, the souls of the Eldari were forfeit as its sustenance. The Allure of Slanesh For most of the remaining Eldari, the birth of Slanesh and the fall of their civilization marked a profound change in the course they would take, not only through history, but also as a people. Retreating to their craft worlds, they forged a new way of life defined by discipline and a determination to fight back against their doom and survive. This resolve 
itself was bolstered by fear which brought the overwhelming majority of those who resisted any change ultimately in line with the new way, that of the Asuriani path. Slanesh was not content with the souls it had harvested in the moment of its birth. It continued to seek out the remaining Eldari, savoring the succulent taste of each soul it claimed. For a member of a race, once so proud and seemingly eternal, the thought of being snuffed out forever to nourish a twisted god was terrifying. That it was a deity of their own creation only served to magnify the horror. Yet some refused to change, whether from pride, a sense of defiance, or the simple inability to change. Some Eldari, the kindred known as the Drukari, continue down a path of excess and sensual indulgence and do so to this day. They live each moment, knowing it could be their last, not only in mortal life, but in eternal existence. This heightened feeling of risk, of spending each moment on the edge of a knife, fuels them to indulge in even greater acts of depravity and to push the limits of sensation. They are not, however, the only ones who damn themselves this way. The powers of chaos hold sway over so many mortals, not because they represent some esoteric concept with rare appeal. No, they are so insidious because they are precisely the opposite. With corn, it is the inherent nature of conflict and the struggle for survival. For Nurgle, it is the inevitability of death and decay, and the fear and despair this engenders. For Zeej, it is the ever-changing nature of the universe, and the need to feel some measure of control through the pursuit of knowledge and worldly power. These are all base instincts of every mortal mind primal parts of the lives of every intelligent living thing in the galaxy. Slanesh is no different. Its appeal is grounded in such seemingly innocent ideals. Every being's pursuit of happiness and the desire to improve, to achieve it. Very little, if anything, holds more sway over the heart of any mortal no matter the species, than desire in all its forms. It is universal. All beings want more than they have. They are never content. Where an imperial guardsman seeks glory, he finds Slanesh. Where a rogue trader seeks wealth, he finds Slanesh. Wherever there are desires, at the end of the quest to sate those desires lies Slanesh and utter damnation. Its Manifestation While Korn is a frightful and terrible warrior, Zeech's sorcery forces its form to defy mortal logic and Nurgle is the ultimate embodiment of its own decaying and physically disgusting creations, Slanesh alone is divinely beautiful. While generally referred to as a he by humans and as a female by the Eldari, Slanesh is actually neither gender, combining characteristics of both and perfecting them. Slanesh typically appears in an androgynous form, in which it is a woman on the right side and a man on the left, 
with two sets of devilish horns growing from its head. Slanesh can assume any physical form, male, female, both at the same time, or no gender at all. But it does prefer male bodies. In whatever physical form it chooses, Slanesh is perfection. A long-limbed, elegant figure with a haunting, almost frightening beauty. Its appearance depends more on the observer than the observed, changing eagerly to please and seduce the eye of the beholder. Whatever its form, two pairs of slender horns always rise from the god's flowing golden hair. Slanesh is often depicted wearing luxuriantly lined, form-fitting armor and bearing a jade scepter that is said to be its greatest treasure. Rumor amongst its cultists says that to look upon Slanesh is to forfeit your very soul to the god's every whim. Its philosophy and methods, sensation without limitations. Well, of course my people love me, only the insane would consider otherwise. Accelerate work on the Grand Hall of Satuary, so all may adore me even when I am not with them. From Walash Prixeti the planetary governor of Prixeti 7. Slanesh can see its hand at work across the galaxy in countless ways. The joy a parent feels when a child is born, the pride a Commodore feels when his fleet executes a cunning battle plan, the stirring of a lover's heart when in the embrace of a paramour, the heady rush of pleasurable relief that reminds a soldier how good it feels to be alive after an unexpected skirmish. All of these sensations on some small level are pleasing to the master of delights. They are not enough. Though the decimation of the Eldari and its pursuit of the remaining few of their species is a source of great joy to Slanesh, it has much, much grander desires to fulfill. Every breath is an opportunity to take in a new scent, each glass raised is a chance to savor a new flavor. On every battlefield, each chainsword blow can elicit a never-before-heard, pain-filled scream. From its glittering palace in the Dark Prince's realm, the Lord of Excess revels in each new sensation discovered. It guides and directs the inhabitants of the galaxy to push ever onwards towards new heights of sensation. A god experiences existence on a level far beyond that of which a mortal can ever dare to dream, but that does not mean Slanesh is content to leave the galaxy to its own devices. It sees the stars, the planets, and indeed the very fabric of reality itself as its plaything to be poked, prodded, ripped, and tightly bound to its will in order to squeeze out every last sensation there is to enjoy. Those who choose to serve it emulate Slanesh as best as they can, limited as they are by mortal form and mortal imagination. In every corner of the galaxy, 
worshippers of Slanesh spend their time inventing new delights and challenging themselves to craft experiences for themselves that no one has ever had before. This can be something as base as eliciting a new reaction to a carnal entwining, or as high-minded as creating a masterwork of art so profound that it brings tears to all who behold it. The truly inspired, though, have much larger stages to play upon. There are so few that have had the pleasure of seeing entire squads of space marines evaporate under the fire of a subjugator chaos titan. Fewer still are those who have heard a million voices cry out in fear, and then nothing but dripping stillness as nucleic acid bombs dissolve the way flesh. Most lack the vision to create scenarios where these delights can be experienced. It is likely not even possible for the greatest excesses to be achieved in the mortal realm. In the realm of chaos, however, all things are possible. Pleasure, Obsession, and Excess Mere killing should never be enough. How much more intense is the feeling of inhaling the mist created when you vibrate a foe's body until he vaporizes? How much more completely have you explored all a person can offer you than when you breathe them into yourself, leaving only the memory of them still a part of this world? From Gilliac Sound Warden, a warp smith to the Emperor's children. Many of the factions of the Adeptus Ministorum and Adeptus Tara embody restraint and denial of base enjoyments, knowing the easiest path to corruption for most imperial citizens is simply freedom. They impose harsh rules and ultimately a harsher existence on their people within the Imperium. For the greater good and the defense of all the Emperor has created, they dictate that each moment of a citizen's waking life be filled with labor, prayer, and punishment. They believe that a human mind left to reflect on anything else is liable to wander toward selfish thoughts and desires. To guard against the influence of the Runer's powers, who use these thoughts as the crack through which they can claim a mortal soul. This cannot be allowed. There is a risk in this approach to order, for from it, chaos is easily born. The merciless attention of adepts, the harsh laws of planetary governors, and other agents of imperial laws have turned many who would otherwise never have embraced Slanesh. A mind overwhelmed with hardship and unrelenting burden has no time for thoughts of sin, but when a moment does come, fleeting though it may be, it stands out against the darkness of life as a burning candle of possibility. For many who stray, sin is not an act undertaken for the sake of rebelliousness, but rather as a way to find relief. Relief from constant struggle, relief from dogmatic rules, relief from restraint. It is this relief that Slanesh offers in over-generous amounts. It is not just the downtrodden people of the Imperium who feel the crush of hardship in a bleak and foreboding galaxy. War 
is a constant presence across the stars. Limitless numbers of beings compete for limited resources, creating conflict and strife everywhere. There are even humans who exist on the fringes of imperial rule for whom life is little better than if they were fully under its yoke. The harshness of life in the imperial center is overwhelming, but it does at least offer a modicum of safety compared to frontier existence. Life is hard and cruel everywhere in the galaxy and any chance to feel some comfort is very difficult to resist, a fact the Dark Prince exploits to its advantage at every opportunity. A bit of kindness, a moment of joy, is often all it takes to set a soul on the path of damnation. It is not just a reprieve from suffering, that lures so many toward their doom in the wicked embrace of the Prince of Pleasure. Comfort is but one sensation in a myriad of possibilities. What of those who, like the Eldari of old, have experienced what it means to live a life of luxury? Removed from the harshness of daily torment that so many others suffer with, people with the time and the means often find experimentation appealing. The finest foods, the most exotic incense, musical performances from ancient peoples long extinct, those with the wealth, time or will to do so can procure all this and more. Yet obsession is not the exclusive province of the wealthy or powerful. A mind and body with no access to luxury can take delight in things that more prosperous individuals would never even notice. Something as simple as a sound of wood crackling in a fire or the sight of drool forming patterns as it soaks into cloth, or even the taste of freshly cut fingernails can be the focus of an obsession. All that is required is a desire for more and a willingness to put aside restraints and limits. Neighboring homes are made from plenty of wood that can burn, and the people inside them have mouths filled with drool that can be coaxed out, and fingers that have plenty of nails to eat. It is a simple thing to indulge, especially once all attention is given over to the obsession and other regards are ignored. Regardless of the craving though, there are limits to how far a mortal can take their obsessions. There are actions and sensations that only a dark mind aided by powerful allies can experience. For instance, with the right mutations, fingers can become ethereal tentacles able to pass through the skull and absorb the pleasurable memories of others directly. Given the right ritual devices infused with warp energy, a bold mortal can distill the fears of a tortured captive and create an exquisite libation not found in even the richest banquet hall. In exchange for as trifling a thing as a soul, a person can be given the power to be able to heal any wound instantly, allowing them to live over and over again through the experience of cutting out their own organs. All these sensations and so very many more are open to those with the desire to embrace obsession 
through service to the master of excess. And finally, addiction. When the Dark Prince tore a hole in reality with its coming, its nascent form knew only hunger and cruelty. It consumed billions of Eldari souls, reveling in their horror as they greeted eternal damnation deep within its form. Quickly it moved on to other torments, not only seeking ways to devour the rest of the species that had given it life, but taking delight in the task. The sensation of consuming those who had created it was a pleasure that few can comprehend. Ever since, Sarnash has pushed itself to find new joys to fill the gaps between its soul meals. It takes delight in suffering and pain and basks in the adoration of those it punishes. It is not a simple being, however, and these pleasures can only go so far in sating godly desires. Through its followers, Sarnash continually experiments with sensation. All beings, both mortal and demonic, feel pride, want more, seek improvement, or obsess on both material and immaterial longings. The Lord of Excess gives these beings the power to claim what they seek, and in so doing, allows them to experience the sensation of gratification. The cruel trick the Lord of Excess plays upon all its followers is that along with power, it also gives them cravings for more. It gives them addiction to sensation, as they sate themselves and in turn become insatiable. Slanesh binds itself to its followers and it feels what they feel. Each bolter recoil that jars the shoulder of the Chaos Space Marine firing becomes a lover's caress. Each drug-induced dream is shared as a sumptuous meal. Each vile urge of the Dark Prince is, to a tiny degree, passed back to its followers, rewarding them for their obsessive actions and inciting them to greater deeds. Even the other dark gods of chaos can satisfy the desires of Sarnesh through the actions of their servants. A berserker who kills in the name of Korn is proud of his achievement and takes satisfaction from his gory deed, and Slanesh feels that pride and the drive for greater glories. A spy whose actions topple a regime is rewarded for their service to Zeej, and delights in their stealth. Slanesh feels that spark of pleasure and increases the mortal's need to perfect their abilities. A diseased plague victim that draws strength from Nurgle to survive rests with comfort, and Slanesh fuels their love of the resulting indolence and serenity. In these ways, the actions and sensations of all beings can serve to feed the lustful hungers of the perfect prince. The Cold of Slanesh Take care lest your protests become tiresome. I have asked for so little. Anyone would think that I had asked you to sacrifice yourselves and your sons. And yet, in Slanesh's boundless and pleasing mercy, I have asked only for your daughters. Surely you would not deny me my small enjoyments. 
from Tyrell, a renegade lord of Arden 9. Slanesh is the youngest of the Chaos Gods and alone of the Runer's powers. The Prince of Chaos is truly beautiful to behold by mortals. It is as seductive as only an immortal can be, disarming in its innocence, utterly beguiling in its manner, and irresistibly tempting with its words. Slanesh can assume any alluring physical form at will, and it is impossible for a mortal to look upon it without losing their soul and becoming a slave to the Prince of Pleasure's slightest whim. Mortals that seek charisma and fellowship turn to it for its gifts can make one popular and inspiring. Poets and artists are drawn to Slanesha's gaze by the promise of inspiration and fame, while even the hardiest warriors might seek the adulation of the masses and the iron-clad loyalty of their followers. Yet, as one continues in the service of Slanesh, such pleasures soon grow stale and its servants are driven on to search for ever greater sensations and ever more self-fulfillment until only the most decadent and debased of acts can stir their emotions or provide the pleasure they have come to crave in the purest form of addiction. Slanesh is also the chaos god of passion, obsession, luxury, art, and indulgence. It is the manifestation of all hidden vices, cruel passions, and secret temptations that mortals hide fearfully in their hearts. This abject lack of restraint pursuit of pleasures lures many mortals to its side, often gathering in places of carnal pleasure to pay homage and praise their depraved lord. Slanesh's followers seek pleasure in every experience and quickly become inured to more mundane things, including sounds and colors. Thus, they frequently wear garish, brightly colored armor or clothing, which is extravagantly decorated. The followers of the Prince of Chaos pursue ever greater heights of experience, seeking pleasure in increasingly extreme and outrageous fashion. Its influence often reaches into the upper echelons of hierarchies where the greatest luxury and privilege resides, corrupting nobility and the wealthiest of imperial families. It can be seen at its most insidious among those that strive for rectitude, as if the Prince of Chaos takes particular joy in corrupting those that dare to proclaim themselves as upright souls. Even the most pious pontiff of the ecclesiarchy must rest some time, and when he does, the unconscious desires in his dreams betray him to the master of all carnal joys. The more civilized a society becomes, the more frequently seeds of corruption planted by Slanesh sprout within it. As leisure becomes widespread due to the technological advance, the unconscious wants of the many are led down dark paths by the subtle influence of Slanesh. Its worshippers engage in great orgies involving every vice and perversity to praise the Lord of Pleasure, where the death of many through exhaustion and overstimulation is taken to be a sign of the Dark Prince's favor. 
its devotees say that any extremity of sensation or emotion can open communion with Slanesh, for the echoes of its birth scream reside in every mortal's soul. They pursue a rapturous, tortured, orgasmic, drug-fueled state of hypersensuality, their souls burning bright and hot like shooting stars as they plunge ever deeper into the psychic maelstrom that is Slanesh. Countless worlds have fallen into complete anarchy, when pleasure cults became so widespread that all order was lost in an insane frenzy of self-gratification. On many, the fall of the Eldari is reenacted in microcosm as society collapses and the howling winds of chaos ravage the world through the minds of its psychers. The handful of gibbering survivors that are sometimes left behind are so changed by the experience that they can no longer be called in any sense mortal or sane. Certain inquisitors of the Imperium have cultivated a particular loathing of the followers of Slanesh for the corruption they spread so readily through the God Emperor's mortal realm. Their efforts to suppress the pursuit of pleasure inevitably brings an ever-widening circle of recidivists, smugglers, criminals, and black marketers into contact with Slanesh's mortal adherents. Its servants, by their incantations, Conjuration and accursed crafts have seduced, depraved, and corrupted both man and beast, bringing them low in the sight of others. Numberless are their enormities and horrid offenses, heinous and wicked their every action. Reveling in perversity and debasement, twisted in mind and body, these insidious servitors of the Pleasure Lord take delight in all manner of abominable and unclean deeds. The denizens of Sarnesh spread the depravity of chaos to the unwary and uncaring with heretical crimes that cry out against nature and the true order of the world. Amassed on the field of battle, the electric colors of their contorted forms offend the eyes as their diseased lewdness offends the mind. Half-bared torsos of pink and blue boast of unreigned lust. Others display limbs of glistening greens and yellows, pale shades of corruption which belie the darkness they hide inside. They have abandoned the last vestiges of true decency and sacrificed their humanity to serve the dark power of the Prince of Pleasure and spread his corruption among the innocent. Its worshippers are known for their complete lack of fear, as they see even losing a battle or their own lives as a new experience to be enjoyed. While not interested in the dirty warfare of Korn's narrow-minded berserkers, Slanesh does enjoy combat of the artistic sword, taking pleasure in watching extremely talented gladiator battles, where the act of fighting is transformed from a means to an end into an art form all of its own. Slanesh bestows its favor upon any who act on an interest for an art. Whether the art is that of combat, of painting, of poetry, or of passion, the favor will aid the artist in creating, amplifying everything created to immeasurable levels, while at the same time corrupting them 
indescribably, such that any mortals who look on them are at once both entranced and terrified. The Mark of Slanesh combines the conventional human symbology for male and female, although it is seldom worn openly by its followers. In its place, they often wear items of jewelry bearing erotic motifs. Followers dress in robes which are often open to leave the right side of the chest uncovered, a requirement of many of the rituals involved in its worship. Pastel and electric shades are the chief colors, although white is often used as well. These colors are also sometimes carried over into everyday wear, although they may be modified to fit in with current fashions. Regardless of any considerations, all Slaneshi followers wear garb of sensuously high quality. Slanesh is served uniquely by the Chaos Space Marines of the Emperor's Children Traitor Legion. Hedonistic psychopaths who wield unique sonic weaponry in battle. Slaneshi Corruption Those corrupted by Slanesh at first experience every sensation and new situation with an unbridled sense of wonder flush of pleasure, feeling every aspect of life as if through new eyes tinted with wonder. But as time goes on, it requires ever more extremes of sensation to feel the same bursts of pleasure, soon leading to a need to be constantly surrounded by extremes of sound or garish color particularly bright pinks and purples. In time, moral degeneration sets in, as an individual corrupted by the Prince of Chaos engages in only the most extreme behaviors, such as sadistic murder or highly degrading sexual practices in order to feel the enhanced pleasure offered by Slanesh. By this point, an individual is usually so beholden to the Chaos God that he or she will begin to be granted mutational gifts by the Dark Prince intended to enhance their pleasure or physical perfection. Groups that have been knowingly or unwittingly corrupted by it often engage in radical body modifications using makeup or clothing or even beginning to surgically alter themselves if the technology is available, intending to increase their perfection or ability to experience pleasure with every sensation. Ultimately, even death itself becomes an experience of immense pleasure, both dealing it out to others and, in the end, undergoing it oneself a final moment of orgasmic pleasure before the soul is absorbed by Slanesh in the Immaterium. The enhanced pleasures and sensations experienced by every soul corrupted by it and all the corrupt things they do to service this need strengthen the Prince of Chaos in the warp, where the psychic emanation of such deeds further feed the young Chaos God's power. The Champions of Slanesh Across the galaxy, billions of souls give themselves over to it through corrupt acts of devotion. Men and women throw themselves upon the altars of degradation or wear the skins of their loved ones in the hope that their divine lord takes note. For most, this is a futile effort, as most acts of depravity and sin are common 
in a vast galaxy populated with the insane and depraved. It takes much more to attract attention and be noticed by a god of insidious excess and true artistic achievements of pain and pleasure. To be recognized as the most devoted of wicked souls requires dedication and effort far beyond what most mortals can achieve. Those who can push themselves ever closer to perfect depravity, who can reach the greatest levels of excess, may be recognized as champions within the ranks of the followers of the Lord of Delicious Torments. For the rest, there is no glory, no reward, only common death, or the short and painful lifespan of a degraded chaos spawn. But recognition as a champion of the Dark Prince comes with a price the Chosen are glad to pay. Their souls are forfeit, but the lure of possible immortality in the form of demonhood makes this price a pittance. To stand at the grand stage with the Lord of Sensation in a life forever onwards dominated with unquenchable desires is the one desire truly fulfilled. Now on to the rivalry between the other ruinous powers from Slanesh's perspective. Slanesh is said to have little interest in the other ruinous powers, being too caught up in its own pleasures to be interested in alliances or cooperation. However, the followers of Khorne with their boorish beliefs in bloodshed for its own sake are particular enemies. Cults dedicated to Khorne and Slanesh clash frequently in the mortal realm just as their demonic legions are believed to battle endlessly in the realm of chaos. This relationship has an effect upon the nature of the armies dedicated to either god. Slanesh's comparative weakness in direct confrontations is balanced by its endless capacity for corruption, often even leading Khorne's faithful astray through their own battle lust. A widespread and technologically advanced conflict is particularly vulnerable to Slanesh's influence, as a single well-placed convert can have the means to wreck a fleet or destroy an entire city. Wherever Khorne's followers become most strident, those of Slanesh can be found working subtly in the background to bring about their opponent's downfall. While it is the youngest of the major Chaos Gods, Slanesh is still a crucial player in the incomprehensible, great game that they play for dominance. Although it cannot yet hold its own against any one other major Chaos God, its support in an alliance is often enough to swing the balance, allowing Slanesh considerably more influence than its absolute level of power would otherwise allow. Of all the complexities of the great game, the most compelling is perhaps the relationship between Slanesh and its brother gods. None can amplify Khorne's fury like the Lord of Excess, whose earthly luxuries and lusts defy the blood god's desire for indiscriminate slaughter. The mere mention of Slanesh or its schemes is enough to cause volcanoes to erupt across the Blood God's domain in the realm of chaos. Though Khorne is the only god openly hostile to the Dark Prince, Nurgal and Zinj are also ill at ease in its presence, despite the fact that the most 
typical hierarchy of power between the four major chaos gods sees Slanesh at the bottom. Even they feel the magnetic pull of its matchless charisma and are both attracted and repelled by their younger brother. This is due in part to the fact that all the Chaos Gods embody in some form the excess for which Slanesh is known. Korn with its bloodlust, Zinj with its scheming, and Nurgle with its spreading of plague. Each is an obsession the Dark Prince can turn to its will with merely a whispered promise. Lurking deep within the psyche of each of its brothers is the suspicion that the influence of the Dark Prince is rapidly growing, and that Slanesh will perhaps one day eclipse them all in strength. With this thought in mind, any alliance of convenience with it is especially short-lived. While this could be attributed to simple distrust of one who changes sides at whim, there is an argument that the Dark Prince's rival gods fear the secret power it holds over them. Now onto the Dark Prince's realm. I prepare to enter his realm, expecting to encounter guardians who would seek to tear into me with talons and fangs. At the least, I assumed I would find bastions to bar my progress. I found none. The land before me was open and pristine. Its fields shimmered like gold and its forests bore fruits of sapphires and emeralds. I took a step into this place and instantly knew I was lost just as surely as if I had been impaled on a debtor's spike. From the heretical tome, the confessions of Cardinal Wogolta. Slanesh is unique among its brother gods. It does not try to keep others out of its home in the realm of chaos the Dark Prince's realm. It invites them in. Through a series of tests, it defends its gleaming palace against assaults. Tales such as that of the heretic Cardinal Bogolta describe this palace of Slanesh, also known as the Palace of Pleasure as sitting at the center of the Dark Prince's empire, surrounded by six other domains arranged in concentric rings. Each ring holds different temptations for those who wander through it, imploring them to succumb to the pleasures it offers. Temptation is a weapon just as powerful as a chain sword or boulder. Traps can be sprung to eliminate the weak and dim. The bodies of those who succumb to the myriad temptations of the Dark Prince's realm are consumed by the land itself, or turned into statues that beautify the view for others. The souls of these lost and damned unfortunates feed Slanesh's insatiable hunger. It invites them in so that they might sustain the god and its realm. Those who pass early tests may catch its eye, giving it some amusement for a time as it watches them resist, only to inevitably lose themselves to one seduction or another. Those rare few who make it to the outer walls of the Palace of Pleasure may be graced by a visit from the Lord of Excess itself. None have ever made it into the palace unless Slanesh wished it, for all who have looked upon the god's perfection 
have fallen to their knees and given themselves over, mind, body, and soul, to its dark majesty. The Excess of Riches The Ecclesiarchy uses stories of wayward souls like the Heretic Cardinal to try to warn their servants of the dangers of temptation, drawing from the crazed descriptions of the Dark Prince's domains and minions that are related in such tales. It matters not if these accounts have any basis in real experience, or if they are purely mad raving brought on by fever or drugs. Real or imagined, they are powerful tales for protecting the simple-minded from among other things, dreams of wealth and the pleasures it can buy. In the first of the rings of the Dark Prince's realm, day turns to night and the golden hues are replaced by soft blue. The sky shimmers ceaselessly. The heavens are filled with diamonds that seem as if they could be plucked from their place in the sky if one could but reach just a little further. Indeed, many try to do just that, forgetting themselves as they do, not paying attention to their surroundings. Higher and higher they reach, climbing trees made of pure gold, even leaping from the bars, only to plummet back to the ground, fracturing skulls and rupturing organs when they crash. The end comes to them then, but it is a joyous one, for in their minds they see only handfuls of glittering jewels. It is a temporary joy, however, in exchange for a fleeting moment of false elation, they forfeit their immortal souls. Scholars of the Runer's powers collate tales of the impossible realms of pleasure and pain, and often describe the first of Slanesh's treacherous domains as confronting visitors with a spectacle of riches beyond the wildest dreams of even the most avaricious merchants. They tell of the trees, grass, and other plants made from living gold. Gentle breezes cause the grass to shimmer like the waters of an ocean under a noon sun. As the wind passes over the blades of grass and through the branches and leaves of the trees, it takes on a voice that beckons all to take as much as they want and more. The mountains that rise up on the horizon reflect a glorious warm light, letting all who see them know that they too are formed from gold. Pathways through the fields are paved with cobblestones not of granite or shale, but of ruby and emerald. At the edges of the paths, Loose gemstones and gold nuggets sit, waiting for anyone to pick them up and slip them in a pouch. There is always room for one more glittering stone, one more pebble of gold. Wandering souls ensnared by this domain would do well to recall the legends that say that if those who lined their pockets with these treasures were able to take their eyes off the objects of their desire, they would note that not all they see was shining. Dull bits of bone and other remains are plentiful here as well. These are all that is left of those who fill their pockets, pouches, sleeves, and boots with so much gold that they collapsed under the weight of it, unwilling or unable to let the riches go, 
They died where they fell, smiles on their faces, despite their impending ends. Next, the excess of sustenance. Mad ravings from those who claim to have seen into the beyond say that if an intruder is able to pass through the ring of golden fields without succumbing to greed, he is next confronted with a lake so vast its shorelines fade to nothing in the distance. The only other land to be seen is a smattering of pale islands connected to each other by a network of bridges. The finest wine serves as water in this lake, but no cups wait to be filled. The bouquet of the wine is strong, pleasant, and enticing. Words from fiery sermons begin to fade in the face of such serenity. Most visitors take very little time before they give up on the idea of cups and fall to their knees to drink directly from the lake. Heads swimming with delightful intoxication, many continue to drink until they slip into the waters and sink below the surface, never to be seen again. Those who are able to lift their heads from the wine, cast their gaze more closely on the islands and see them for what they are. Hunched giants holding aloft great tables, heaped with extravagant feasts. Exotic fruits, rich breads, and meats of every kind are present. Swimming to these islands is perilous and many whose senses have become wine-addled sink beneath the waves, joining the countless others who have slipped beneath the carmine liquid. For the ones that make it, the reward is astonishing. Each bite is better than the finest meal they have ever experienced. Each morsel is a decadent delight for the tongue, Faster and faster the wayward consume the food. The voracious eater forces handful after handful down their throat. In their blind need to consume, they do not notice that some of the meat comes from carcasses with an all too familiar form. Even if they were to somehow stop forcing food into their own stomach long enough to recognize the fate that awaits them, they could not stop. Given completely over to gluttonous indulgence, the mortal only stops eating when their body fails and they finally collapse into the feast awaiting the next hungry dinner. The Excess of Bodily Delights There is perhaps no easier way to corrupt a mortal than to appeal to their carnal instincts. Entire imperial libraries are filled with tales of lurid corruption on one side and manuals with instructions for fighting it on the other. In his heart, a preacher knows that his congregation is most likely to fall because of the indulgences of lascivious desire than from any other temptation. The Dark Prince surely knows this as well, and it is why the legends say it fills the third ring of its domain in the realm of chaos with visions sense and experiences that overload the mind and body of anyone who makes it this far. Rich fields of pleasingly textured grasses fill this ring, lit with teasing golden hues. 
Soft tents made of spun, dream threads reflect visions gleaned from the deep subconscious of those who gaze upon them, forming sinuous corridors so narrow that a traveler cannot help but brush up against them and feel their cloying embrace. From one vista to the next, visitors travel through a series of decadent tableaus, each more twisted and inviting than the one before it. The crude flesh dens of the underhives or the elegant shadowed parlors of the hive spies cannot present anything close to what the Lord of Endless Delights offers. Demon and mortal bodies entwine until they become one, forms so beautiful they are difficult to look at, lie couchant, beckoning, resisting is all but impossible. The sights and sounds of the offered pleasures are sufficient to enthrall most who see and hear them. The assault on the senses does not end with these things though. The air hangs heavy with an intoxicating musk so rich and pervasive that it penetrates the flesh of all who pass through it, quickening the heart and opening the senses further than thought possible. Thus stimulated, flesh becomes hypersensitive to even the most gentle breath of air or tender caress. Scents waft from braziers in which smolder the embers of an incense that triggers memories of amorous encounters of the past. A mortal in this state is easy prey for the purveyors of delights that surround them, closing in on their now willing victims, demonettes offer comforts with softly voluptuous flesh, kisses from razor fang mouths, and embraces from piercing claws. The Excess of Adoration Within the ranks of the militaries of every star-faring species, talk of glory is common. Troops are motivated to achieve more than they believe they can by speeches from commanders who exhort the ranks onward to glorious victory. When battles are won, the returning heroes are held high and showered with praise and adoration. This effect on the hero can be profound. More is possible, he thinks. More can be achieved. More glory can be his. Insidiously, this can also lead to fears of letting it all slip away, of failure and derision. In these thoughts, a path to Slanesh is laid at the feet of the hero. This path is not restricted to the military, leaders of government, churches and cults all seek approval as well. Even fathers want their children to look up to them. The path described in the heretical cardinal's confession is crowded with wayward souls, a path that leads to the fourth circle of the Dark Prince's realm. For each visitor here, the experience is unique, though there are commonalities for many. Massed throngs may greet a soldier, cheering his name and erecting statues in his honor. Planetary governors may see themselves establishing such complete order that they gain control of an entire star system. Whatever the scenario presented to him, the victim of these visions finds it incredibly difficult to pull themselves out of the pleasant dream. Unlike the dreams experienced when a person sleeps, these illusions do nothing to seem impossible. A soldier has seen others elevated and has been trained for acts of glory. 
Histories are filled with tales of governors who have carved out greater realms among the stars. These and more offer solidity to the visions encountered, drawing the dreamer farther and farther into illusionary depths. Only self-doubt gnaws at some, and these are the ones who break free. When they do, the dream shatters, revealing, if only for an instant, a vast plain of black suit. Upon it, heaps of bones are buried beneath the bodies of millions of others, standing and lying in the burned ashes, still trapped in their individual delusions. The unsettling image flashes by in an instant, and the traveler is confronted by the traps of the next circle. The Excess of Achievement when the god emperor of the Imperium created the Space Marines, legend has that he faced the difficult task of engineering a warrior that was eager to serve him through great deeds of heroism and by achieving the impossible in his name. At the same time, these soldiers needed to be humble enough to realize that victory earned in the name of the Emperor is not personal that they are simply weapons to be wielded in his hands, unquestioning and obedient. As is known to those who have studied those ancient times, he failed. Legions rebelled, led by prideful Primarchs who questioned his plans and thought they could do better. All the while, the Prince of Chaos whispered encouragement in their ears, as it does to all visitors to the fifth circle of its domain, if the blasphemous tales are to be believed. What appears to be a grand forest with dense clusters of majestic trees that house secluded glades is, of course, a trap. The sound baffling effect of the trees puts the mind in an introspective position. The long walk gives it time to wander. The glades are inviting and serene. In the center of each glade is a perfectly still pool that invites the traveler to sit and reflect upon their thoughts. As they stare into the pool, they recall their accomplishments and dwell on what more they could achieve. Sitting there, lost in thought, the undergrowth of the glade begins to creep in on them. Thorny branches reach toward them, strangling vines descend from the trees and gently coil around their neck. As they close their eyes, and imagine themselves striking down legendary foes, conquering galaxy-spanning civilizations, or negotiating heavily favorable warrens of trade. The waters of the pool rise up and take the shape of whatever represents defeat for the dreamer. Sensing something is amiss, the ensnared visitor opens their eyes and is confronted by a vision of shame and defeat just before the branches and vines rip at their flesh and choke the air from their lungs. The sound of their final scream, stifled by a lack of air, is a delight to the Dark Prince. An incredibly small number of travelers resist the temptation to dream and are spared the torment of confronting their failings. They rise exhausted by their trials and pass into the sixth and final circle that stands between them and the Palace of Pleasure. The Excess of Repose Life in the 41st millennium is hard, short, and brutal. For many, each day is a struggle to simply survive to the end of the day. 
Even species that do not suffer the oppressive yoke of imperial rule are not without burdens. The Eldari, for example, must ensure that their craft worlds are supplied and ready to repel invaders, all the while haunted by the knowledge of the terrible fate that can await them should their souls fall to she who thirsts. Still, bodies need rest. Surely any wanderer who has made it to the last of Selnesh's defensive rings must be wary and especially deserving of repose, even if only for a moment. Upon emerging from the delightful torments of the previous five circles, anyone who could resist the seduction placed before them at this point would surely become legend. Awaiting the beleaguered traveler, Say the whispers of those depraved riches languishing in perfume palaces and pleasure dens is a vision of sublime peace. All struggle is surely a thing of the past, all torment a distant memory. Here is a beach of softest sand, warm by the rays of a golden sun. Gentle breezes push scattered clouds through a perfect azure sky. Music is carried on those same breezes, soothing the spirit. The ground itself rises up and caresses the body of the weary wanderer. Cherubs begin to remove armor plates and burdensome belongings. Coalescing from the salted mists of the waves that break upon the shore, figures with placid features and soothing hands approach and rub tired muscles. The memories of an arduous journey fade into nothingness. Peace is the wanderers at last. It is peace eternal. If the will is not strong enough to snap consciousness back to reality, determination sends the placid apparitions screaming back to the seas. Resolve collects displaced armor and other possessions. Herculean effort forces the few strongest invaders to rise up and approach the final destination. The palace of Slanesh lies ahead and surely any who could pass through the six trials is prepared for what awaits. And at last, the palace of pleasure. A determined warrior, demon or mortal, who survived the predations of the six circles of the Dark Prince's realm and their inhabitants would naturally assume the Palace of Pleasure, Slanesh's residence and seat of power, would be defended with legions of demonettes and fiends. Surely his keepers of secrets would confront any invader that made it to the Dark Prince's abode. Thick walls must surround the grounds and towers of his demands. Slanesh has no need of such defenses, however. Any invading force, from a lone space marine to legions of bloodletters, would find that the only guardians present would be the statues of the finest alabaster and perfectly shaped trees. Confused as these warriors might be, nothing could prepare them for the presence of the master of the realm. As the invaders contemplate what they perceive as a lack of defense, the air stills. Unseen choirs sing, and ears weep at the unholy harmonies. A god emerges from his palace, striding confidently toward the awestruck invaders. The Dark Prince smiles. It is enough to completely disarm any who stand in its presence. They are lost, and they care little of the fact. This, the tales say, 
is why there are no defensive walls or demonic hordes around the palace. There is simply no need. Resistance in the face of perfection is not a possibility. What becomes of those thus ensnared is beyond speculation and more the subject of fevered dreams. Not one soul has trod upon the grounds of the Palace of Pleasure and returned to tell the tale. Scholars of the obscene and decadent debate not only the fate of those who get this far, but even the very structure of the grounds and the palace itself. There being no first-hand accounts, who can say for sure what form the citadel takes? Some say the palace is a single humble dwelling, making the appearance of the Prince of Pleasure even more grand in comparison. Others say it is the most opulent structure ever conceived, stretching four kilometers in every direction, including upward. Most agree that it must be magnificent. A god of excess and perfection must have a domicile to match. If this is correct, then the spires of gold and marble surely ring an inner courtyard wherein statues of exquisite realism are placed. These statues might be the final form of those who succumb to the disarming allure of Slanesh. If so, then their faces would bear a countenance of absolute joy. These statues would capture forever the perfect moment of grace that one would surely feel in the presence of perfection. It may be that the only inhabitant of the Palace of Pleasure is Slanesh itself. Perhaps no demons of any kind are required to embellish its inner sanctum. Or it may be that the palace is filled with life, a den of iniquity where decadence unrivaled is played out eternally. Regardless, it is the seat of power for the Lord of Pleasure, the Master of Painful Delights, the Prince of Obsession. It is home to Slanesh.